Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, the UTC IISC seminar, uh, Professor Jin Gang Yi, uh, from not too far away, Rutgers University in New Jersey. Uh, Jin Gang has been a uh, very highly active researcher in the field of uh, controls, mechatronics, robotics, and uh, it's my great pleasure that he can come and give a seminar. So, as a brief background, uh, Jin Gang received his bachelor's degree from Zhejiang University, and then uh, afterwards a master's degree in Tsinghua University, and another master's degree in mathematics in, uh, from UC Berkeley, and then followed by a PhD degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, he's actually currently uh, very active uh, in many societal uh, service programs as associate editors for many important journals, and also he himself has been uh, a great mentor to his students, I think. He is a co-author of many best student papers in our field, including IEEE, ASME conferences, uh, and ICRA as well. So uh, those are very important conferences in our field. Uh, so today he's going to talk about modeling and control of unstable physical human machine interactions, a rider bike bot example. And, uh, uh, before I uh, formally give the time to Professor Yi, uh, I want to also mention that he has re received multiple important awards from the community, including NSF Korea Awards, uh, awards in cybersecurity systems, etc. So uh, let's welcome our speaker. All right, thank you. Um, you know, it's been very pleasure to be here. Uh, even though I, love, I know quite a few faculty here in the mechanical and, uh, and also the WE here, like uh, Peter is very uh, great mentor to me, and also Xu uh, for the nice introduction. So uh, my research areas, uh, I was trained as an applied control um, engineer, and over years I have been development uh, the research areas in the mechatronic systems, the design, dynamic systems, applications in many uh, different applications. Uh, for example, you know, we'll talk about uh, the vehicle system, robotic system, but also transportation and other domain. So um, just a few overview of my research uh, projects in the recent couple of years. Uh, primarily, we had uh, three major, my, my research areas, three areas, the robotic vehicular, uh, vehicular uh, system, the autonomous vehicles, robots, and also the, some of the underwater uh, robots are working with uh, marine scientists at Rutgers. I heard about that uh, at UConn. We have very strong... Uh, research in the underwater uh, vehicle system, and also the uh, center uh, is coming. It's coming. So another area is the physical human-robot interactions, which is uh, one of the topics I'm going to talk about today. The human uh, bike bot uh, interactions, and some others. Uh, we're also working on the wearable robotics for the sleep and the fall projects, and uh, third area is the automation science and engineering, which is uh, Peter is one of the um, the founders for that area. So we had the conference and journals, and in these areas, so we're working on the civil infrastructure systems, and using the uh, automation techniques for many in uh, the civil infrastructure system and also for the micro nano manufacturings. So today I cannot cover all these uh, topics. I pick up one. I actually I asked uh, Xu when I, before I came, you know, what kind of topics would be good for here. And uh, Xu just uh, lastly to point out, you know, anything will be interesting to the, to the engineering students will be good. So I'm pick up the human bike interactions. So um, the reason I pick up this, uh, I get in, uh, interested in this uh, topic uh, back to 2005. When I was a, a, a faculty member, uh, a, a research faculty member at the Texas m and so um, we have a development this uh, autonomous bicycle for Doppler Grand Challenging. So if you remember, there's a Doppler Grand Challenging that 2004 started, 2005, uh, there are going to be a, a, a winners uh, in the Southern California. Then they, they come to the later years for the Grand Challenging. So the idea we come up with the bicycle, uh, motorcycle as a platform for competing autonomous driving because it's a unique platform. So uh, the, the reason is that it's a single track vehicle, so you can go through the very narrow uh, terrain and be very agile. And uh, look at what is a human can do with the bicycle systems. Really, you can see that you know, human can control the bicycle and really do some really highly um, agile maneuvers. 
So we team with uh, uh, Berkeley, some of the Berkeley students. Uh, actually, it's, uh, it's not uh, officially with the Berkeley, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the school, but it's uh, sponsored by the Berkeley Engineering. Then some part of the, you know, me and the, and the dead song at the CS at the Texas at the M, so we work together with them. So um, by that time, you know, when we look at this performance, I think a sample of this, like this video here, uh, the, the control of this uh, platform actually is very challenging, and, uh, you know, you have to keep the tracking of the desired trajectory at the same time you keep the balance. So as you see that, uh, it's really crashed with this uh, narrow pass here, and uh, so it ends up with not successful due to, the, you know, one of the reasons is the control techniques there. It's not uh, mature. It's not has not been really advanced such that we can do whatever I want and uh, demonstrate the human capabilities like what we showed in this video. So because of that, I get started. And uh, then later years when I joined Rutgers, I also came to, um, I also showed these two videos. And on the left-hand side is a, is a video um, published in the New England Journal of the Medicine by 2010. And you have these patients with Parkinson's disease before they call the freezing of gait. So the first part of the video, you can see that it's nothing surprise. You see these uh, patients, 58 years old by then, and uh, really barely can move their, the foot to move. And in the second part of the video, which is uh, you're going to see later, uh, actually these patients can put it on the bicycle. They can ride the bicycle just like normal people. So when I saw this as a mechanical engineer, I really get amazed and say, okay, so we, t we know what is the dynamics of the bicycle system, motorcycle system. Can we develop something to a rehabilitation purpose or to understand how really the human motion involved with this uh, unstable mechanical platform? So that's the right-hand side. Uh, we developed this uh, indoor bicycle system with a senior design, and uh, really it's, uh, just started my interest uh, into the bicycle dynamics and the human robots, human bicycle interactions. So um, now, what is uh, what is uh, so academic or research point of view? What is the difference? What is the challenge in there of the, this uh, platform? Well, obviously, this is you know, human is um, is high degree freedom systems. So modeling and uh, understand how this coordination with this uh, unstable platform is one of the interesting, uh, in, important part. So and also, um, how do you analyze or quantify the human uh, motor skills when they ride a bicycle is important. You know, you say, oh, this is a nice uh, rider. You know, it really can, you know, the, the, the bicycle system is like a toy, right? We always see that uh, this is a mechanical system. It's like, you know, these are so proficient, it is so efficient to manipulate this uh, platform. So how do you quantify that? So how do we quantify that using mathematical tools? How do you quantify that, you know, this is a good rider, this is a bad rider, right? So that's the challenging part of this as well. Now also, how do you use that platform to tune the human balance skills so that you can diagnose this, the, you know, certain disease by using the bicycle platform or treat some, you know, some, uh, dis some dis disability people with, uh, with the balance the problems. So that's the, that's the challenge we're facing. That's the problem you know, we're trying to solve uh, in, my, in my research group. So um, over years, we had to develop this, what we call the BikeBot platform. So this is the platform so we're trying to break down. So we try to understand how humans interact with this platform. So human is a closed system. So the idea here is how we're going to break down the human's sensory motor mechanism. So the idea we come up with here is to break down the steering, the pedaling, and other uh, actuation mechanism, you know, when the human and the, and the robot uh, and the bicycle interact with each other. So because of that, we modify the steering and put the motor there. And this, this motor can be, this uh, bicycle can be as active as the autonomous mode, but also can be ride by the human. And also we change the, the, the powering for the, for the bike and use the motor to drive it. And uh, you can use, you still can pedal in it, but we can, we can uh, autonomously control it. We can, on purpose, to change some control rules such that we can bring down the sensory motor feedback loop so that we can cheat in the human. We can do the system uh, diagnosis or system uh, identification for the closed loop system. So that's the one where, where we did this platform. Now, the objective here for our study is, first of all, as we mentioned about, is the human is a high dimensional, you know, uh, redundant systems. How do we do the modeling? Because, you know, for you to control, for you to understand, you need to do the model as the engineer uh, approach. So second one, we want to do the quantification. We want to, you know, define some metric to say, you know, this is good riders versus the, the bad riders. 
And the last one, we want to analyze the system, you know, particular stability and the other uh, aspects. So today, my talk is going to focus on these three um, aspects of these interactions. So the first one, we're going to talk about the modeling. So how do we do this uh, modeling approach? So the, one of the challenges we have been discussed here is uh, this is a highly dimensional, you know, human joints. You know, it had more than like uh, 30 or 40 degree freedom, right? So uh, how do we model these uh, systems is, uh, is a challenge. The traditional way to model the mechanical system, as a mechanical engineer, we all know that uh, you can do the um, Newtonian mechanics or Lagrangian mechanics. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue with that is you can handle, you know, maybe a few degree freedom, but if the degree is going to like a 20 or 30, it's not manageable, particularly if you try to analyze it, right? So you can do the numerical, but if you want to do the uh, analysis, it's challenging. Recent years, uh, you know, there's a lot of approach has been done, uh, particularly in the uh, you know, computer science or the robotics field, they're trying to do the data-driven. So we're, we're not going to do this uh, physical principle-based. We're going to look at the kinematics data or maybe kinetic data and trying to figure out what is the relationship among this motion. The, the downside of that is your lack of the physical interpretation. So basically, you, you reduce the data dimension, and you don't know what is, uh, this uh, data is going to represent in the physical world unless you're going to map it in the back, right? So, so we want to preserve of those, both of the modeling approach. So the, the modeling, com the, the approach we come with here is we're treating the bicycle and the human trunk as the physical system. We're still using the physical principle to model that. This is a relatively uh, lower dimensional uh, space, so we can do this model. You know, basically, the, the, the human trunk is like the inverted pendulum sitting on a seat, and the bicycle, we know that you can model that pretty precisely. Now, for the mean motion, we're going to say, okay, so for the mean motion, we're going to be using this uh, embedded learning, so manifold learning. This is a technique coming from computer science. They're trying to say, okay, so we had a bunch of ways to try to um, capture what is the data on this lower dimensional manifolds. Now, that has the physical uh, interpretation here because think about the human movement here. The, particularly, you ride a bicycle, you know, your left hand, the right hand, the pedaling around, they're correlated each other. Your right hand and left hand are just do the steering. So their motion are not completely, completely independent, right? So their, their motion actually sitting on the lower dimensional uh, manifold space. So if we can capture that motion in the lower dimensional manifold space, then we can get this mean motion uh, in, a, in a lower dimension. Now then, you have combined these two modeling approach by integrate this uh, physical base with the, with the learning based. So this can be done by using the constraints between those, and also you can design some fictitious inputs for the, for the lower dimensional learning, uh, learning uh, approach. Now, let's just turn back to this uh, briefly about this physical modeling. It's very standard. You know, you have the inverted pendulum here with the human, so you, you, you do have these uh, three angles. The bicycle has the row angles, and then you have the, the combine those two, you have the states, you can get the Lagrange equations here. Now, the input of the system is the torque of the human. You know, you, you, you mean, you get a torque there, and also the steering angle, right? So um, for the, for the data-driven approach, uh, we do have a bunch of the different uh, approach here. So basically, you have the, you know, you have the, you know, you define the latent space, which is a lower dimensional space, much lower. So the dimension of the latent space is uh, using the small d, which is much less than the capital D, which is the joint space uh, dimension, which is the joint angles. For example, the upper limb probably at least uh, each each limb had uh, five degree freedom. So combine those at uh, ten degree, you have lower limb, maybe twenty degree. Then the trunk, and the, it depends on how do you want to detail the modify, uh, modeling in the human. Now, there are some, if you do the, the model reduction, right, you need, to, you need to reduce this dimension from the higher dimensional joint space to the latent space. So there's a bunch of ways to do the dimension reduction, the PCA or LLE, and those are the typical way uh, using the, the dimension reduction methods. So now, one of the uh, disadvantages here is, uh, you know, we cannot present the, uh, preserve this, the physical interpretation. Question? Yeah. You purposely did this without any sensors. That's right. Why? Well, it's, uh, we just want to capture this, uh, this uh, model aspect uh, rather than put the attached sensors on the name. So it's just like a, we use this as an application for the post estimation, which is I'm talk about later. But the reason is we want to describe this uh, 
a higher dimensional motion into a lower dimensional space for the modeling purpose. Did you have an insight that is observable in, in some sense? Oh, I'm, I'm talking about one example, probably you can just, uh, you know, how we're going to determine uh, what is going to influence, uh, what is the templates, or what is uh, we call the templates or, perm or the motion permittive of, the, of this motion. We kind of pre, uh, there are some knowledge we want to enforce there to, to, to uh, get in this uh, learning space uh, restrict. Like, for example, if you had a paddling effect, this is our uh, closed curve, this is our cyclic uh, motion. So you can enforce, uh, say, for example, closed curve constraints when you restrict, when, you, when you're trying to learn this uh, latent space. Yeah, you do have some, if you have some uh, ideas about this uh, motion, you probably can restrict the, the motion in a latent space. Yeah. So uh, the approach we did here, so we take a, a Gaussian dynamic model, uh, process dynamic model per, uh, approach, this model here for the, for the lower dimensional space. And for the reduction here, we're trying to propose, uh, we call the exonlinear embedding methods, which is uh, trying to preserve the physical meaning of these uh, latent variables. So that's the part we want to, we want to achieve. The Gaussian process dynamic model is, uh, you know, it's been used in the modeling of the human motion. So basically, you have this uh, latent variable x is sitting in the lower dimensional space, and then you have the observable space in the, in the, in the, in the joint angles. So basically, you have this nonlinear uh, mapping between f and g. Between, uh, this is what we try to estimate it. So uh, given the, the observation, which is uh, joint angles, and we define the fictitious control, that's a part is also the freedom is, is we try to enforce there. You know, there's a freedom there. You can, what kind of fictitious control you want to uh, inject into the, the model here. So we're trying to, uh, this is quite a standard. We're using the, 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 the learning-based methods trying to maximize the posterior distributions, which is I, I don't want to go through in that detail due to the time limit. Now, what I want to mention here is this uh, um, XO uh, linear embedding uh, approach. So back to, you know, answer to Peter's uh, questions here. Now, when we look at, the, for example, the upper name motion here, so we're trying to, trying to put the questions, what is the influence of the upper name motion? Well, we look at the bicycle examples here, we're saying, okay, so upper name has been, you know, when you put it right in the bicycle, you have the trunk movement, which is influenced the lean motion. And also you have the steering angle, which is influenced the, 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 the lean motion. So when we look at that, we'll say, okay, what kind of angles for the, for the human trunk is like a pitch angle and a row angle. So, and also the steering angle. So we, in that case, we define so-called the motion permittive, or we also you can think about sometimes you call templates. So what are going to input, what are going to influence this lean motion? So we define, we predefine this. So this is kind of we enforce. This is knowledge we say, okay, we know this is something to influence the name, upper name motion. Now for the lower name, we see that it's paddling, so that it has to be uh, cyclic, uh, uh, cyclic motion, so that it has to be you know closed curve or or circle topologically. That's the equivalent to the circle. So you can enforce this constraint when you do the learning. You're not randomly, you know search for anything, you're looking at these constraints. So by these, uh, by these templates or primitives, we can, per we can think about these uh, three-dimensional latent variables. Indeed, is just like a coordinates. You projected the motion into this three axle. So that's, that's the physical meaning of these uh, latent variables. We're kind of uh, trying to uh, have this kind of uh, uh, interpretation of that. Now, let's take a look at one example here, like I just mentioned about. We don't put the sensors on the upper name. We want to estimate the motion by using this model. So uh, the upper name has a 10-degree freedom. And then we said, you know, the, the template here is a three because you do have the trunk, uh, pitch angle, row angle. Now, we don't consider this, uh, this self-spin angle uh, for the trunk because typically you ride a bicycle. It's really, you know, you're not really use that motion that, uh, that big. So that's the way we define this as a dimension of the reduced space is three. Now, the fictitious input to the latent dynamics here, which say this is a steering angle, steering angle rate, and also the trunk angle and the trunk angle rate. So those are measurable. So we can measure those. We can put the encoder. We put the IMU on the human body. And uh, then uh, we, we said, you know, we're, we're not going to um, build, uh, put the sensor on the name, and we're going to rather use this model as an application we want to demonstrate that, that you, you don't need the sensor to do that, this kind of uh, estimation. 
So the experiments we had done, basically, we put, as I said, you know, we put the IMUs on the, the gyroscopic on the, on the bike and the gyroscopic on the, on the, on the human. And uh, then we're using the dynamics constraint. So basically, that's a non-grounding equation. So the dynamic equation serve as a constraint. Rather, using is as the you know forward dynamic. We're using the uh, reverse dynamics, right? So inverse dynamics, so that we don't we don't want to do the integration um, um, integration uh, action because that sometimes numerically sometimes is not stable. And uh, then we, ha- we also have the geometrical constraints. So basically, the, the human arm is going to touch on the on the on the on the, on the handlebar, so they form the link, form the uh, structure, uh, the linkage uh, structure. Then we're trying to estimate uh, the state and the latent variable, and then we're going to project it into the, into the higher dimensional uh, angles, joint angles. So here, just uh, one subject experiment. This is a time uh, trajectory for the, the trunk angles, the first three, and the last one, the bike row angles. And the bottom four are just uh, uh, four examples for the joint angle for the upper name. I just pick up four out of ten. Now, in this plot, we have three curves. One is uh, the dashed black one, which is uh, EKF. That's the estimation we have. The, uh, the blue one, what's the ground truth coming from the motion capture system. And the red curve here is a direct integration of the gyroscopic. Typically, that's going to drift. So because, you know, that's well known. It's the noise. So you can see here pretty much uh, the, 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 the black, you know, which is our estimation tracking with the ground truth pretty close over a long time. Now, if you look at the, the performance in terms of statistical data, um, here we just compare the, our uh, reducting approach with the PCA and the LLE, and also the last row here is you put the sensor on the body and you compare with the sensor what is, uh, what is the performance. So our conclusion here is, uh, you know, basically our ALE approach uh, seems like uh, at least it's, uh, it's uh, comparable or even better than the PCA and the LLE reduction methods. And also this model without the sensor attached on it, the model, uh, the pred- pred- prediction is uh, comparable to the sensor, uh, to the sensor which you put the uh, variable sensors on the human body. Now, we also did the indoor and outdoor multi-subject experiments. And uh, the results are consistent. And uh, we say that indoor is slightly better than outdoor because outdoor, the ground condition is a little bit bumpy sometimes and uh, you get uh, perturbed. And uh, this result is still cons- uh, con- is consistent and is comparable. Now, we also look at how many data you need to train that, uh, that learning model. And uh, this is a show on the right-hand side. Oops, sorry. Oops. What's going on here? Okay, okay, so um, this is, you see that, um, oh, oops. So the data we need, really, that doesn't, you know, 200 data sets, if you think about, you sample the data as, you know, you know, 100 hertz or maybe, you know, 50 hertz, that's a very reasonable amount. And the uh, left hand figure here is showing when you have this uh, dynamic constraint and uh, geometric constraint, really, this is a really useful constraint to really reduce that uh, drifting factors. You know, only with the model is not good enough. You have to add down those constraints. So just as, yes? What's the difference between indoor and outdoor? Well, the outdoor, we're running the larger scale, uh, larger size. Indoor, we're being constrained. Our lab is relatively small. So we got uh, three meters, uh, three or four meters circle. We're running that. And the indoor is a flat surface, nice uh, finish. So the the... Y con system is inside is better ground truth, so overall the performance is slightly better. The outdoor is a large outdoor, you know, in the parking lot. So we're using uh, we don't have the Vicon outdoor, so we're using the uh, the vision system. We put the camera in front of the riders to look at the markers on the human to get the the the, the ground truth. So it's with not like a mountain bike. no, no, it's not like uh, it's still on campus. So it's, it's a, you know, ground condition definitely is not like, uh, you know, floored indoor. So it's still a little bit bumpy, uh, bumpy there. So that's the main difference. So we talk about the models, and uh, now we say that we have combined this learning and uh, physical models. This is nice. And uh, so um, now the second part of that is uh, we don't have the model. Can we use the model to do something related to quantify the motor skills? So uh, how do we quantify the, analyze uh, the, 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 you know, we know that we balance the bike, we use the upper body movement, we use the steering. So which one you're going to use the most? Or which one you should use uh, when you have some balancing task? That's the one we want to get in some understand. 
And the second one is we define the metric, right? And the third one here is, uh, you know, we do ride the bicycle because we have two tasks. One is you follow the particular trajectory. Another one is you maintain the balance. So these two, these two tasks, it sounds to me, you know, sometimes they're competing each other. Sometimes probably you were, going to, you were going to say how you're going to compromise one with the other. So also we want to understand, you know, you design an autonomous bike and how the human performance with the autonomous controller. You know, can we do some comparison? So that's what we did here in the second part of my talk. And now what is the approach we're using here? Now we're relying on the dynamics of the system. So it turned out to be this uh, uh, trunk bicycle system is a nonlinear dynamic system and it certifies so-called ex external internal convertible form which is what I'm going to discuss a brief thing about that. Now, with that property, you know, we think about if you ride a bicycle, we all have the experience. When you turn on the curve, right, you have to tell your body to adapt to that turning. Depending on the turning speed or the turning radius, you tell your body by different angles. Now, we define that angles as so-called balance equilibrium manifolds. That's played a central role here. So the idea is, you know what trajectory you're going to follow. I calculate what is the balance, the row angle, angular read, or we need. And then we can capture the, your, your performance around that manifold. So we define how far away you from that equilibrium point as a distance. Use that as a metric. So let's go into that detail about that. Now, this internal, uh, ex external convertible form um, you know, as, the, as the control engineers, we know that you, you can partition the nonlinear dynamic system into two parts. One is what we call the external system captured by this X. And not, another one is called the internal system captured by this alpha. Now, the, what is the special, you know, we know what this nonlinear system can be turned into the normal form, and this is the very special form, the normal form. Now, what is the special of that is uh, this is a convertible um, kind of, a, you know, if you do the input transformations, the internal and external are just uh, exchanged or are equivalent to each other. That's a very nice property. Now, the reason we put the nearly here because we do have the inputs coming from the human, right? So we want to consider human steering, human uh, move their body. So putting it more uh, graphically, so here's what we see here. So you control the steering speed, you get the output. The output here is the position of the bicycle. That's the external system. Now, the raw angle of the human and the bicycle system, that's called the internal system. So really, if you care about the trajectory of the bicycle, you don't need to care the row angle. But of course, that's a part of the dynamic system. You cannot neglect that because that's the internal dynamics. You want to keep a balance of that. So um, now, uh, in this case, we can uh, design this, uh, calculate this uh, equilibrium manifold, uh, so-called balance equilibrium manifold. So for given control, so for given human control here, for example, you can calculate what is, uh, what is the balance equilibrium points or what is the row angles for you to go to, to satisfy that trajectory. So the trajectory is calculated by, you know, you given, you follow, you assume you can track in that direct trajectory precise and what is, the, uh, what is the row angle you need. And that we call the balance equilibrium manifolds. Now, as if we see here, the difference, the torque difference, you try to drive the system in the internal dynamics to that manifolds, we capture that torque as the, you know, the function F here, I cannot go through the detail of this notation here. The, basically, here is a tau, is, a, is, a, is a, the torque inputs, and here is the human inputs, and here is the, vehicle, the bicycle velocity. This is the yard rate, and here is the equilibrium points of the row angle. So you can see this equation here. Basically, this is a torque uh, di differential or torque residual. So if you want to say that C system is perfectly balanced, you want this residual equal to zero. All right? So we define that. Yes? One on the previous page. Oh, so it's the Q and QE. So Q is a general case, QE is a equilibrium. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So uh, one thing we have here is you know the equilibrium, uh, equilibrium manifolds. You can perturb it and you can figure out what is the sensitivity in terms of the upper body movement and the steering angle. So by that way, we calculate the sensitivity for steering actuations and also the sensitivity for the, for the upper body movement. So we want to understand, you know, there are the two actuations here, which one is going to be used, which one is going to be, what is the relationship of that? So we can, we can perturb that and get the sensitivity. Just give you an example here. Um, these two figures showing the sensitivity. So the left-hand side is, a, is, a, is the upper body movement and sensitivity as the upper body row angle. 
So this is a, um, by different curve here means a different yard rate. So your turning rate, that's a different yard rate for the bicycle. Now, uh, at the right hand side here is uh, the sensitivity function of the, of the um, this is the steering angle. So this is by the different velocity, different bicycle velocity. Now, the take home message here is, if you look at this magnitude of those uh, sensitivity here, you will find out the steering actually takes a big rule. It's, it's five times larger than the upper body movement. So in that sense, that means, really, if you perturb the human, basically, the human is going to use the steering. It's going to be more effective in terms of, in terms of the balancing task. So that's the time we, we formally analyze that. Now, so because of that, we propose two metrics. One is the balancing task. We only care about the balance. So that's we talk about it. We just use that uh, F function and use the first uh, equation. That's uh, two vectors. We're using one, one element of that vector, uh, two-dimensional vectors, as the metric one. So that's capture the balance. Now, if you want to capture the, both the balance and the tracking, we're going to use the errors. And that's the, you know, I'm not very satisfied with these results indeed. Um, you know, um, I guess, you know, if any one of the audience here could be propose something, you know, give us uh, some feedback, that would be nice. This is a very traditional way to talk about the errors, right? So, but um, it's not to capture what is the correlation between the balancing task and the tracking task. So uh, we want to find something more, but uh, we didn't come up with a good answer for that. I think the simplest one would add a weight somewhere. We added the weight here, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, the, you know, this is coming from the Neapolov uh, analysis, stability analysis. So in terms of controller designs, we're still using this uh, EIC structure. Basically, we're, like I just mentioned before, you, you know what is, tra- you just designed first of all external system tracking controller. And then once you define that, you calculate what is the balance equilibrium manifolds. Then you're going to design the internal uh, controller to track in the, in, uh, the balance equilibrium manifolds. So that's the overall controller. Now, more clearly, uh, more specifically, uh, which is, the, you know, first of all, you define the external controller to track in the performance uh, feedback controller for the, for the external system. Then you calculate the equilibrium manifolds, and then you do the internal control, and then finally you come up with the controller by combining these two steps. Now, in this case, um, I didn't use the gyro balancer. We have another actuation. That, that's the, using the gyroscopic effect to inject about 20, 30 newton meters of torque. You can help the human balance or you can disturb the human balance. Depends on what you want to use it. Now, in this controller here, we're assuming we don't have anything there. Now, also, I'm going to design the controller we call the U bar, C bar, which is with this uh, with the gyro balancer, we try to help the balance task. So um, this slide is just showing uh, we try to validate the model. So we got this human ride the bicycle and with this edge shape trajectory. And uh, this is the XY position. And you see that uh, there's a target trajectory. And then you have the actual uh, trajectory. Uh, on the right-hand side, the plot here just is showing the, the two equations. With this, the two uh, left-hand side and the right-hand side are matching each other so that we kind of uh, indirectly match uh, the the, the model, validated model. That's the purpose we're, we're trying to have here. Now, with this validated model, we come up with the parameters, and we do the control. Now, I'm going to present the three controllers. Those are autonomous controllers. No human on it. Just to present, you know, trajectory tracking. So, one is the straight line. You're tracking the tra- straight line. We have two controllers, as I mentioned. One with the C-bar is with that the gyro balancer. So, you, you're not just to control the steering. You're not to control the velocity but also you have the torque, additional control inputs. So basically, you have three control. Um, so in that case, uh, you, you, you know, intuitively, you think, OK, that should be better than without the, this balancer, which is turned out to be true. So you see that this trajectory with, uh, with, the, balance, with the gyro balancer is going to help you to balance more, better, in terms of performance. And here's the control inputs between these two. This, this one has three inputs, and this one has two inputs. And here, we show this uh, pivoting angle for that uh, you know, probably you didn't pay attention. I think we had one more picture uh, showing this uh, gyro balance. I can show you uh, a little bit more about what is this angle here. That's a pivoting angle for this uh, spinning disk. For the circular motion here, similarly, um, we have these uh, two types of controllers. Uh, the, the message I want to present it here is uh, we can control this bike at any trajectory as we want. You know, of course, it has to be feasible. Um, what we presented here is the position error here um, and also the, 
the, the BEM, the equilibrium balance manifold that we calculated, and also what is the actual one. So we do the comparison. And the same thing here, you know, we do the comparison under two different uh, type of the controller. Again, the, with, the, with the gyro balancers, tend to result tend to a slightly better. A question. For this autonomous case, mm -hmm. you still have humans sitting on top of the No, no, no. There's no human. Just autonomous. Just the human computers control steering, control the speed, and control the gyro band, the pivoting and angle. like Uber driver. Yes, yes. No, Uber drivers still have a driver. Oh, so the, no, it's different. The Uber, because the, that's the difference between the bicycle riding and the car riding, right? Because car riding, you sit in a car, your movement is not going to change the, the motion of a car relatively because of mass and the platform. Now, bicycle, you sit in there, whatever you move is part of the control action. Okay. So, so that's the reason, you know, this is just like a completely autonomous. Indeed, I think we're, we're probably the first, first team to get in the bicycle autonomous to track in both the tracking and, uh, and the balance. So as far as we, we know, yes. A quick question. So your control input U, um, so the feedback terms are also, one depends on the acceleration feedback, that's what I saw. Like. Yeah, it's, it's not, the, it's or even the third derivative of the desired trajectory because we do the dynamics extension. Because you know what is the desired acceleration. Yes, we know, we're assuming we know everything related to the trajectory. We know if you give me the trajectory, I know the time derivative, second derivative, and even the third derivative. And you, are, you know the position and the velocity. We know position and the velocity. So, now, yeah. yes, yes. So what happens if I don't take the acceleration? Well, that's an excellent question. You can do um, so-called, uh, um, there is a technique we can do. So that's the difference between the trajectory tracking and the path following. Mm -hmm. So if you do the path following, you can think about uh, the velocity as part of parameters you can, you can control. So you can use a technique, so-called um, time suspension technique, which is now you don't, you don't parameterize the trajectory by time. You parameter the trajectory by the another va uh, variable, say tau. Tau's derivative is with time, you can change that as a part of the input. So you have a more flexible. So actually, when humans drive the car, they're not really parameterized by time. You apparently have that, you know, how should I turn when I have that location? What is my speed? You can do the pass following. That's what we say the pass following uh, controller. That's the slightly modified control design. You can have this uh, using the so called time suspension technique. You can uh, do um, trajectory uh, pass following rather than do the trajectory tracking. And you have guarantees for that controller that because it's a highly non linear system? It is, it is. But we guarantee the stability because uh, this uh, input output uh, convertible platform. The dynamics, that's a very strong condition, actually. Because the, the internal system and external system can be actually equivalent in the sense that you can basically, here's the, 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 the essential thing. You don't want, so basically, you don't want to asymptotic convergence to a point for the external system, neither for the internal system. You compromise both. And the, comp comp the compromisation here, the, comp the, the, the compromise there, actually turn out to be you can make, maintain their convergency to a certain bound. <laughs> and you can tune that bound, uh, but you cannot squeeze that bound too much because if you squeeze too much, then you're going to need a, a large control authority, which is you don't want that. Same as you balance the uh, platform, right? When you balance these things, it's more feasible you balance it by this uh, oscillating around the equilibrium rather than you want to this perfectly you know, stable at one point because that needs a lot of action. You need a lot of uh, control action, you know, because this, this is also model-based. So what you got from the lab of uh, error uh, function, the stability? Yeah, we, got, uh, we, we, we didn't present it here, but we have the proof that uh, stability. That's not our initial uh, re results of that. We extended the results in the literature. It's not uh, our original development. So if you're interested, I can, I can share you uh, that uh, result. So would the third order derivative be very noisy? We have assumed that it has to be a smooth. If the third derivative has to be continuous. No, continuous, I'm sorry. It's not a, it's not a smooth uh, infinity uh, derivative. It's just like uh, the third derivative has to be continuous. But it's OK when you do the experiment? We do the experiment, it seems fine. Yeah, this is the experiment the same spot. Those are circle, eight shape. Those are satisfy those conditions. Uh, we didn't try anything like a hard corner turning, right? Which is, uh, you know, it's not derivative, it's not continuous. So, but in practice, you're trying to approximate the trajectory with the smooth uh, uh, trajectory. Okay, so um, now one more thing we did here is uh, we want to understand, we want to compare the human. So we, then we put the 
we put the autonomous driving aside, we say, okay, let's let the human do the same kind of maneuver. Let's kind of say, what is human behavior compare that with autonomous, uh, uh, autonomous riding, autonomous controller? It's turned out to be actually humans doing the similar things as autonomous controller. So here is uh, just a few plots. Here is the bicycle row angle, which is uh, one is a human ride. This is calculated the balance equilibrium manifold. This is the actual humans doing. And then same thing for the, for the this is the trunk, human trunk row angle. And so we can calculate this dash nine red curve by the, you know, by that the equations we have, the equilibrium manifolds. Now here's the human control inputs. So here's the human control inputs compared with uh, the, the autonomous controller, EIC controller which is followed pretty well for these eight-shape uh, maneuvers. Uh, so that's kind of turned to be very surprising. Really, you know, uh, we can kind of uh, see they, they, they are the design, we design the controller, what the humans doing are very similar kind of behavior. Now, again, we look at the metric. So what is the metric here? The balance metric, which has the human control and also the, the autonomous controller. Uh, the human control actually can be turned pretty well. You know, it's pretty graceful when they turn. Now, this sharp turn here, you see this curve here. This is actually an eight shape on that uh, conjecting point. That's the cross point. So it turned out to be the controller actually is doing a you know, relatively bad job at this cross point. They had a spike in terms of what is the metric here in balance. So I think the human can do a better job here. Now, he, this is the second metric, the total metric, right? The, the, the metric two. And then here we want, as I mentioned it before, we want to see that uh, intuitively we think, you know, if a human might try to maintain the balance at the same time maintain the tracking error, those two should be correlated to each other. And so we plot this curve, these two errors, so we kind of like a face portrait. We want to see whether there is a correlation between your balance error and also the tracking error. Um, well, surprisingly, we didn't, see any we didn't see any strong correlations between these two errors. These are multiple rounds, and we see that you know, errors have been spread out. And uh, we haven't really figured out how can we figure out, you know, the any correlation, what kind of correlation that should be. Okay, so just to summarize the, the second part, we have the controller and we have the human controller. There are pretty, you know, we conclusion there, there are similar kind of uh, behavior in terms of control. Now, the third part of this is, uh, you know, we have the model, we, we can do some, we have the controller. Now, uh, we also want to do a, a little bit more analysis in terms of stability. The objective here is, uh, first of all, we have see, observed that uh, human, that uh, clinical observation. Can we see something about that? Can we say, you know, yeah, from engineering point of view, we can explain why, what's happening in that human. Um, of course, we're not trying to explain that, uh, that uh, phenomenon, but we're just to provide some insight from our uh, control engineering viewpoint. And also, we want to say, okay, can we... You know, because essentially our goal is design some robot assistive uh, device to help human or tuning the human uh, control uh, balance and capability. So can we come up with something, you know, by this analysis, so we, can, we can have some more insight with it. So what we come up with here, the approach we're using here is we're using some modeling the human neural control. You know, in the previous approach, we just take the experiments. We really, we don't know. We compare that with autonomous controller. We don't model that the human control. Now we go there. We're going to say, can we model the neuro, uh, behavior neuroscientist approach and model this human control? Now, we look at literature, and uh, there's no literature talking about uh, riding the bicycle. However, there are literature talking about uh, standing. So there's literature quite a lot. You know, if you stand, human standing, quite standing, how humans move their body, trying to perturb the human, see how they're going to react to that. So we kind of uh, adapt, uh, adapt to that model, and uh, obviously this model here is, uh, is we uh, uh, adapt, and you see here there's, uh, there are basically human you know, sensory motor mechanism coming through the feedback. Those are time delay system, right? Obviously, you have the muscle here, you have like a spring. Once you perturb, you have the spring to react to that. That's modeled by this intrinsic stiffness channel. And then beyond that, you have the three DNA systems here, which is uh, corresponding to different sensor mechanisms, vestibular, vision, and uh, also uh, proprioceptive uh, feedback. So if you combine this, uh, we, adopt this uh, we adapt this model, and we can capture the human torque. Right? In this case, we're not considering near motion, because near motion is basically captured by the steering angle. So we're not to say the influence of near motion on the balance, we are kind of neglect that. Okay, so we just care about the, band, the upper body movement and the steering angle, right? So with this model here, 
we can do a stability analysis. Uh, of course, we first of all, we validated the model. Here's just the validation. There's the three ways to we come, come up with this torque. One is we calculate using the inverse dynamics model from Lagrange equations. Second way, we use the neural model so in the previous slides. And third one, the experiment. We put the torque sensor underneath the seat so we can indirectly measure the torque by the human. So there are surprisingly are consistent. And with the parameters, we come in from that uh, human standing model. So we're not really trying to uh, get in that uh, parameters uh, uh, estimate uh, precisely. But it turned out to be quite, um, quite consistent. Now, with that, we analyze this time delay system. And here, we're assuming uh, the control input for the steering, this is the assumption we made. We say, OK, the steering is a proportional control with the bicycle row angle. That's very, very rough assumption, because just for purpose of analysis. Right? Later on, we revise that. So then we're going to have this stability chart uh, technique, which is, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, Lajet here is the expert. Uh, you know, we talk, I talked to him, and he suggested us some of the reference and some of the techniques, and we're using that. We can analyze the time delay system. Now, what I want to point out here, which is just briefly mention about this Parkinson's disease, right? In the literature, they reported that. What is Parkinson's disease patients? They call it stiff and sticky. Now, what does it mean, the stiff and the sticky? Now, stiff means your body is very rigid. That means, turn out, the, the, this is not the, our results. This is reported in the literature. The KE, which is one of the parameters, really is getting larger for these patients. They did that. They did a comparison with the control group. And then the sticky part is from the dumping coefficient. The dumping coefficient is also larger compared with the healthy subject. Now, then we took out this results and say, OK, if those parameters are larger, what is the implications in terms of this bicycle riding uh, dynamics? It turned out to be very interesting. Uh, we found out that when the k in is uh, changing the numbers, changing the, this is our plot, of 3D plots are just the, the z-axis is the rightmost roots. Basically, that indicates stability. You know, if it's less than zero, probably it's, uh, it's, it's stable, and then if it's above zero, it's unstable. Now, what's in, in, interesting here is that when k in is changing the va values, so it's really these uh, rightmost roots are, doesn't change that much. Basically, they're saying, OK, if you get stiff, and really, that doesn't change too much about the stability of the interaction. Now, the damping factor here, which is uh, really, if you have the increase the damping factor, indeed, it, you can make the root more negative. In other words, it really help you to stabilize the interaction. So that's a, that's a part of you know, this. We, we did some analysis to come up with this conclusion. It's quite interesting. It's kind of like, you know, provide some kind of, uh, uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, from system point of view. Now, with that, we're going to say, OK, can we do something better? So we assume the steering angle is proportional control in the previous uh, analysis. Now we're going to extend it that. We want to do something better. We simplify the torque model here. You know, rather than in that uh, complicated equation of three time delay, we got two time delay. We simplified in the PD structure. But also, we extended the, the steering angle into a more complicated way, because the steering effect is important, as we talk about in my second part of my talk. So we introduced the time delay in the steering. Now, I highlighted these parameters here in the red color because later on, I'm going to show you that those are the critical parameters. It's going to change the stability and influence uh, this, uh, this uh, interaction. Now, of course, we need to validate this model. Here is the validation of this model. So you see that the torque, upper body torque, and the steering angles, basically, they're just uh, the experiments and the model are really, this, we do this, in this case, we do the needs to square fitting. We estimate the parameter using one set of the data. We validate using another set of data. So that's what we did here. It's pretty reasonable. Now, with that, we did some experiment. Here's the gyro balancer. You see that this spinning disk is running fast, and then it's about 1,200 RPM. Then you're pivoting these uh, this, this, uh, this angles. You're pivoting by this motor here. So by doing that, you generate about 30 to uh, 30 plus Newton meter, which is a compare, well, the human upper body movement, the size of the torque is really large. It could be up to like a 90 or 70 newton meters. It's a very large torque. I, you know, probably we didn't uh, realize that. Um, but this is a comparable, you know, it's at least the, you know, one third or one half of that uh, torque is real. The human is going to react to that torque. I mean, that's the one we, it's not going to be completely to, to balance the, the human bike system, but it's going to be large enough. 
Now, what we did here, uh, we did three perturbations. Now, this one, we generated the torque, so we use that estimated model, the, control, uh, the human control model. Now, we also perturb the riders by using, you know, block their view. And also, the, the one of these, these, these goggles we're using is not only block, it's just there's a, there's a mirror inside, it's distortion. Really, you know, if a typical human right, wear this goggle, even walking, has, uh, you need some time to adapt to that, you know, otherwise you're going to fall. Right? So we want to get in this perturbation and trying to understand you know, how humans react to that and what is, uh, what is uh, stability associated with that. Now, the last perturbation we have here, we on purpose to deny the steering action because we can cut it off the steering, uh, then we can add it on uh, additional delay, we call that the tau s, so that we can uh, inject this delay and see how human, we're still going to turn that same angle as the human commands, but we're going to delay by you know, tau s time. So now the results turn out to be very interesting. I mean, sometimes somewhat is uh, is uh, is intuitive. So look at the, the parameters we have here. So we had the two kind of perturbations, right? Uh, disturbance. One is with delay. Uh, let's look at the, the the bottom this figure here. So this is the KB, the stiffness of the human steering. You know, it's basically uh, when you perturb the human. So you're going to block the view of the human, the view scene part. Then humans are going to react more aggressively. Basically, their last vision, they're going to turn it more, um, more significant. These are five subject experiments, and those are statistically significant. So we, we tested that. And if you block even further, not, not only block, but disturb, uh, distort the view scene, then they're going to increase this uh, gain by making a really aggressive reaction to that. Now, if you look at the time delay here, so if you on purpose introduce uh, steering time delay, human going to reduce their neural delay, neural system delay, the accommodate that. Now, but they have the total, this, if you look at this, this is the total delay. So the total delay actually is capped by 0.36 seconds. In other words, if the steering, you know, is the on purpose delay with the, with, the, with the mechanical system plus the human itself the delay, which is you can estimate, the total together, it cannot go beyond the 0.36. Otherwise, the human cannot balance this platform. It's, they're completely full. They're not going to uh, be able to, you know, those are experienced riders. So that's very interesting. We, we have this kind of uh, similar to some other parameters. So if you look at the, the balance metric, right, what is the, the balance, purely the balance metric, and again, this results is not surprising at all. Basically, if you increase the delay or you block the view, humans go lost gradually. Their bad metric is going to increase, which is getting worse the balance in performance, which is uh, you know intuitively that's understandable. Now, if you look at the stability region, and uh, this is also uh, interesting to see that this is basically this is two gains, right? So this is our this are steering. Because the steering is so important in terms of balance, we talk about in the second part, it's five times uh, more sensitive to the, to the balance effects. So, so if you have the difference in delay, if you increase the delay, actually you're shifting this, uh, not just the shape, but also the, the region, the area of this uh, stability region. And the dots you see here, these are the running experiments, where, the delay, where those parameters uh, in those experiments and you can see that when the delay is small, you have most of the band, you can, most of subjects keep the balance within this stability region. Now, once you increase the delay, then you will see that you gradually see some of the subjects are cannot balance it. The red color here indicates the unbalance, the unstable. So when you further increase here, you see that these uh, dots are really close to or even outside this uh, boundary, which means unstable. And finally, you cannot uh, ride the bicycle. So that's, a, that's a something that, you know, we, we found it out. Now, um, that's kind of a summarize. We, you know, I had a, just a five minutes. I hope, uh, you know, I can just finish it with two minutes. So we, we carry on this, those studies, you know. Uh, the final goal for us is trying to, you know, we have the model. We have the controller. We have the analysis. We have the stability. We have some of the control actuation design. Now, the final goal for us is how do we turn this machine into um, – Intelligent machine, smart machine, exercise machine to train the people or to, 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 to rehab the people. That's a part of which is what we're trying to do in the labs. What we're trying to do in is how do you turn in the human motor skills by using this? How do I change you know, uh, your writing style to somebody else? You know, 
because we have the tool. We have the metric to define that. We have the tool to define that. So the leftover work we're trying to do here is how do we design some controller to control the bicycle? We cannot force human to do something, but we can control the bicycle. And gradually, we can. Like the human way, everybody here, I guess, most of the parents, you know, when you were little, your, your father hold on the bike, and uh, you gradually learn that, you know, how to ride the, ride the bike. Now, we want to accelerate that process. Also, we want to, you know, use that to kind of uh, you know, personalize your writing style with the other. So that's the one uh, I'm, uh, we're trying to head in for. Now, uh, certainly, uh, I have to uh, thank uh, many of the uh, funding agencies, and also primarily this is supported by NSF, and, uh, but also some many individuals, uh, particularly my students, uh, really uh, do the hard work. Without them, I don't think I can present it here. So thank you very much, and um, I'll be here. Any questions you have? Uh, some time maybe for one question. So you think that the human control is like a derivative integral kind of a control which we do? Yeah, at least the experiments are showing that they're a little bit similar. It's similar at least for the steering action. Um, it's uh, comparable to the what we did, the EIC design uh, controller. Yes. Yeah, I saw your, uh, your acknowledgement list. There's one from Rehabilitation Center. Are you really working with medical, doc medical school intensively? No, for this work, no, we haven't. Um, we talked to the, the physical therapist at uh, Rutgers New Work, which is uh, our medical school uh, physical therapist. Uh, we merged a couple of years ago. So this has happened a couple of years ago. They are concerned about uh, putting the patients on the bicycle platform. And uh, we didn't get any, you know, funding. They're, they're, you know, we, we like to get in some study on that, but it's because of the, you know, we haven't finished uh, much of the platform development, and we want to analyze the system. We want to do the controller design. And all this work hasn't really been finished uh, by that time. So we're not, even our, myself, we're not confident to, if you put the, Parkinson's disease, which is have no, you know, the, the disability people there. This is sitting on the unstable platform. They had the concern, even though we had a harness system to protect protect them. But uh, we haven't done anything related to that. But if you use your theory, rather than using trying to use a bicycles, but you can say wheelchairs. So that's crucial, and wheelchairs right now is not very good. Well, yes, one side, yes, from practical clinical viewpoint, yes. Uh, we haven't just thought that much because we're so trying to see the bicycle as a unique platform, and uh, we would like to, you know, kind of roll in this platform to get in, um, getting the human being trained uh, or, or to do something to, you know, more aggressive way to do that. Um, I guess that's true. Probably, you know, we could be more conservative, you know, to to put in something like, you know, stationary bike or maybe, you know, less aggressive, maybe a more, make a few people feel more secure or more stable systems. Uh, we haven't tried anything about that. Yeah, that's, that's good suggestions. We're, we're barely making these uh, results and in the last couple of years, and, um, and now we don't have funding to support it, and uh, hopefully, you know, we can try to get something related to that. You don't have to zoom here. Huh? <laughs> no, that thing is not there because uh, this is the primary mic. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just, I know you're kidding. I just thought NASA is building right now the new uh, landing machine for Mars. They want to have human landing on Mars in 2020. And this might, this is, this was intriguing to me in the sense of stabilizing human in the loop. Yeah, but uh, I don't know how these are related to that in terms of, uh, you know, you could design a very stable structure rather than use the unstable, like a bicycle system. And uh, it just have for certain applications, this probably has an advantage. I'm not sure about, uh, you know, last I was actually looking for some things, you know, they're probably, just, you know, I don't know, it's more stable system will be more helpful. You know, why do you want an unstable system? I don't know. But they are having wild imaginations. I think they're very open to it. I mean, most of, like, if you look at the Google, that uh, the development is a Segway type of the mobile robots with the arm on top of that. 
that would be much stable than the, you know, if you lay out uh, the single track uh, vehicles rather than double track. So SegWiz relatively you can you can control it uh, with uh, without too much uh, problem. But if you think about the bicycle, it's more challenging. Yeah, sure. Okay, I think uh, it's about time to end. Uh, please sign up. You have haven't done so and uh, uh, write the reviews on your on your desk. Thank you.